on. Hey, come on, you're nearly there. Come on, that's it. Bit more. Hey! Pocket Venus, 1961. Many, many men have fallen into that cleavage and drowned. Believe me, I watched a few. They drowned happily. Once and for all, if ever again you put your sticky fingers on any fella that belongs to me, I'll knock that stupid peroxide head right off your silly shoulders. You know, it's funny. I don't remember him, damn, mentioning he ever had out to do with you. No, well, he wouldn't, would he? He wouldn't have chance, not with you throwing yourself at him like he was the last man alive. Did he know that you throw yourself at everything in trousers that comes through that flaming door? It was rather charming, I think, and probably a little childlike, that instead of sort of thinking of herself in terms of actually Hollywood or New York or wherever, or being a universal star, she made herself a universal star in Greater Manchester. And the new crop of fellas look very good to me. Look, if it's all right for you to look at her bird in miniskirts and go, yum, yum, then I'm not going to be ashamed of liking to look at young men. She just adored being... Elsie Tanner. Um, she, she was Elsie Tanner, is, is, is the truth, I think, really. Pat Phoenix was Britain's first queen of the soaps. Known throughout the nation as Elsie Tanner, she played her character in Coronation Street for 21 years. But success came late in life for Pat Phoenix. She was 36 and had been out of work for a year when she reluctantly auditioned for the part. I went in totally aggressive, ready to lose, you see. And I walked in through the door and instead of seeing one man, the six of them... And I don't know if you've ever seen this sort of thing happen. I don't know if it happens to you, but when I become terribly nervous, I become aggressive and I start dropping things and I had an umbrella and a handbag and I, this is a sort of thing. Uh, will you sit down, Miss um, uh, uh, Phoenix? <laughs> Just a minute. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, this chair. And all this business, you see. And then they look me over very carefully and they say, um, will you read that? So I read it. And it was one of those amazing moments that authors, it doesn't happen to authors often, they, Suddenly, she started that with, with the opening line, and I heard it in my head exactly, or in my ears, rather, exactly as I'd heard it in my head when I was writing it. And I gave her the next line, and the next, and the next, and it, it, it was like sex. No, it was better. It was like making love. You know, I'd found my actress. Now, the thing about Pat is she filled it in spades. I mean, she was bigger than life. She was almost larger than the character I think Tony had written. The first episode of Coronation Street was broadcast live in December 1960. Pat was, could have been in a, in a theatre. She was wired and strung and tense, and she wasn't helped by the fact that I was in and out of her dressing room, and I was being sick all the time in the sink in the corner. <laughs> and she sent me off to a loo opposite, but we were clinging to one another. We were clinging to one another, and then I rushed off to an office to watch the rest of it. And by the time I came back, I knew she was a star. Now, look, let's get this straight. Not an hour ago, you asked me for two bob for cigarettes. And you wouldn't give it me, we know. So you're stuck to going in a lady's handbag. Just listen it. A lady, is that what you crack on you are these days? Fine son, a fine son you are. That tongue of yours will get you on one of these oh, days. Oh, give over. Luke, you've lost two bob. I don't know where it is. What am I supposed to do about get it? Get work, get work. That's what you're supposed to do about it. Change record, will you? She was robust, she was gutsy, she was earthy. Uh, she took on everything, whether it was lovers or people who criticised her. She, she, and she had a terrific sense of fun. And also, in a funny kind of way, uh, by her own lights, a sense of maternal responsibility. It's about time you started at all. Eh? To get ready. I am ready. You are not. I am? Dennis, I am not going to be given away by somebody in a black jumper and a Union Jack. A roll neck sweater, every fibre a man-made miracle. It is very nice for a loving in Albert Square, but today is different. Your mummy is getting married. And I, I really don't think until then anybody had associated glamour with the back streets. She was sex on legs. She was very, very sexy. She oozed an earthy sexuality. She'd suddenly go and yank a bra strap up in the middle of a scene, which normally you'd think, oh, no. Oh, she'd have a little bit of a scratch, you know. <laughs> and it was all very northern, ordinary, real. And um, I don't think she even thought about doing things like that. I think she just did what came naturally. 
You look a hundred and one, not... Not what? To do a scene with Pat was like a fantastic game of tennis. You know, she hit it. And she'd say, come on, good year. You can hit harder than that. From your background, hit it. You're you can't right, even keep a fella of your own, can you? At least I don't hold open house. Bring your lorry to LC Tanners. You cheap foul <laughs> mouth flunge yeah, you! I suppose the older you get, the more jealous you get, eh? All right, I've heard enough. Now, come on. Come on. Oh, Shouldn't you be saying that to that bag? She didn't have red hair for nothing. I mean, she could really, really let fly, as, as we see in so many of the scenes. So, of course, that was in Pat's makeup. That was part of her character anyway. At one stage, you had three redheads in it. She didn't like that one little bit. And there was always mutterings and mumblings in the makeup room about these girls. She'd had a hard time, and, and, and she brought that, that kind of, that edge, that, 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 that sense of reality. I mean, she'd known what tough life was. Pat Phoenix came from a broken home in Manchester. Her father was a bigamist. Her stepfather told her she'd never make it. Determined to act, she toured the country in repertory theatre for 18 years, living in digs and earning little money. But in the mid-50s, she hit the headlines playing opposite Tony Booth in the controversial sex play A Girl Called Sadie. She played this very glamorous, sexy woman, and it was rather a rude play <laughs> that sort of <laughs> people were a bit, ooh. So to me, I thought of her as very successful. But real success eluded Pat Phoenix. By 1958, she was in London. Work was scarce, her first marriage had failed, and the future seemed bleak. I just had had enough, and I thought I was a failure, an utter failure in emotional relationships, in, in work, in everything I did. And I turned the gas on, and I didn't light it, just as though it was an accident. I'd, I'd forgotten to do it. And I sat down with a book, and I started to read the book, and I fell asleep, or, as I thought, I'd gone into the other world. But half an hour later, I woke up, there was a big smell of gas, and the gas had run out, and I hadn't got another shilling, <laughs> and the cat was meowing for its food. <laughs> and I looked out of the window, and suddenly I thought, oh, come on, get on, fight, fight, for God's sake. And I did, and that was it. So the stupid bear has to marry some grotty old has-been from the wrong side of the tracks. What did you say? Well, didn't he? Get out! What, Mr. Superman? <laughs> and that! Well, I ask you. I hate you! Go on, then, hate me. Do what the hell you like. The meteoric success of Coronation Street turned Pat Phoenix into a television sensation. You would say she wasn't the greatest actress. Her acting was fairly limited. But what she did without that great acting ability was something that stars absolutely have, and that is the ability to make huge effects with a very small amount of means. And I can't think of any other person in any soap who has had quite that star quality. Pat went into makeup made up. And I used to say, what time did you get up, Pat? And everybody always waited to see what Madame was wearing. And if she had uh, blue denim on, she'd be a good sport, an old pro, comfortable, easy. Uh, tailored, she'd be stark, professional. But uh, woe betide you if she was in scarlet satin. <laughs> and she was perfectly capable of being in scarlet satin at nine o'clock in the morning if the mood took her. <laughs> you never saw her in the same clothes twice, ever, cos she used to take one... <laughs> one lot to the elite, and then bring another lot out, wear that lot, take it back to the elite, and bring another lot out. So every day was a surprise, you know? I mean, she used to turn up sort of in costume every day. The elite sells second-hand clothes. And when most people were embarrassed about buying second-hand, Pat Phoenix reveled in it. And she'd pull the rag back, and then she'd flick the garment, she'd fit, and then she'd come across something, and she'd like, oh, that's and she'd throw it on there and then flicking through, flicking, and it, it was dramatic and the hangers would fall and then she'd wash over to the counter, there'd be hangers everywhere and we'd all be fussing and picking hangers up and putting things back. And really, it was almost a relief when she'd gone. I mean, we loved having her here, absolutely loved having her here, but it was, gosh, you know, and we'd tidy up. And she was an absolute whirlwind. Pat's passion for clothes spilled into her professional life. 
Wrangles with the wardrobe department over Elsie's outfits were not unknown. The whole point of Elsie Tanner was that she was wayward and did what she wanted when she wanted, and that was why she was so perfect for the part, uh, because that's what Pat did. And yes, of course, there were, I know there were wrinkles, but you can't keep Pat Phoenix down. <laughs> she wears what she wants. You won't dump, jump down his throat, will you? No. Does he not marry, are you? Do I look married? You're not, are you? You're not. No, I'm not married. She saw her whole life thing in terms of some kind of romantic novel, you know. She created that background for herself. So she said, can we go down in the basement? I love that room. And it was her room, that's where all her books are and that's where we did all our chatting. And we'd go in and she'd throw herself on the settee, throw her shoes off and her head back. She loved old films, black and white, very late at night, and she didn't go to bed till two and three in the morning. We used to have all these snackies and chocolates and truffles and champagne. We always had the champagne down here. We used to spend so many hours watching black and white films, and it was all that kind, all romantic. Then we were in Venice, drifting along the Grand Canal in a gondola with the sound of mandolins coming. Pat would be totally, uh, completely capable of falling up in love with her leading actor. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. In 1969, Alan Browning was brought into the street to play Alan Howard, Elsie Tanner's new lover. When Alan came into the programme, it just seemed very right. He was uh, Richard Burton to her Elizabeth Taylor. I, Elsie Tanner, do take thee, Alan Patrick Howard. To be my lawful wedded husband. To be my lawful wedded husband. I now declare you are husband and wife together. Eighteen months after their screen wedding, Pat Phoenix and Alan Browning married for real. Pat kind of saw it as a lovely circular thing to do, you know, a romantic, that I marry this man on screen and then in real life we get married. What a fairy story. She used to say to me, never let me marry them. <laughs> I think the romance and the courtship was the, uh, the thing that Pat loved. Come on, Elsie, whenever the crunch comes, you make the decisions, don't you? Only because I had to. I never had anybody to do it for me before, not before now. All I wanted, all I ever wanted was, was to be loved. I just wanted someone to look after me. Elsie's on-screen dramas were mirrored in Pat's own life, even down to Alan's drinking. Do you think he's got a, a drink problem? Do you mean, do I think he's an alcoholic? Yeah, well, do you? Once I went down to breakfast and he was drinking what I thought was a glass of water and it was a glass of vodka. In 1973, Elsie Tanner and Alan Howard left the street in search of a new life together. We take on the whole world, people like you and I. In reality, and despite his drinking, Pat Phoenix and Alan Browning quit television for the theatre. A sellout tour of New Zealand followed their tremendous British success with the play Gaslight. She brought into that theatre, I should say, 75% of each audience, and it was packed every night, with people who'd never been to the theatre before. They'd obviously gone to see Pat Phoenix, Elsie Tanner, because they loved her on the screen and they wanted to see her in the flesh. I think she would have been a huge star in every sense of the word if she had been brave enough to perform on the West End stage, at the National, at the Royal Shakespeare or the Royal Court, any of those places. But she 
didn't have the confidence to do so. She was offered quite a lot of work um, in the West End, but she just was frightened. She was frightened that the Elsie Tanner, Tanner image was basically what everyone wanted to see. After three years, Pat returned to Coronation Street, alone. Alan's alcoholism had driven them apart. In the end, I think Pat just couldn't handle it any longer. But there were many, many occasions after they'd split up when he or his friends would phone and say, he needs you, can you help? And she would. She'd, she'd do something, she'd go or she'd... And the one occasion when she couldn't was the time when he died. After years of excessive drinking, Alan Browning died of liver failure. Because there were vacuums in her life, I think that's why she loved being a star, because that probably filled a need in her. That gave her an identity. She uh, bought this grand house and there was a swimming pool. There are even those little floating rubber things where you can enjoy your drink as you wallow around in the water. She showed me a bathroom which was all mirror except for the floor which was white fur. But she always had this strange sort of mixture as well. You'd go in and she'd say, we're having fish and chips tonight, kid, but there's some champagne there if you want one. <laughs> and it's sort of the mixture of champagne and fish and chips was pat. I mean, that was pat. <laughs> It was this combination of glamour and backstreet earthiness that gave Pat such a huge following. She was in constant demand for personal appearances, and at bingo halls across the country, she'd tell fans her life story. The venues were packed to overflowing. She loved going to bingo halls. She had a contract with a whole chain of them, and then she had one, a nice little earner on Saturday mornings where she used to open butcher shops. If it was there, she'd open it. Ladies and gentlemen, Pat Phoenix. Pat Phoenix, or as we know her better, Elsie Tanner. Pat Phoenix. In 1980, Pat Phoenix met Tony Booth once again, 25 years after their first passionate affair. Tony was recovering from a near-fatal accident, which had left him badly burned. It was beautiful. Uh, it was just finding somebody who actually understood what had happened and felt the same way, and, and because she had been through pain as well and could understand that. And um, we both cried, actually. We had to wait a long time for each other. We had to go through a lot of experiences to find each other again. We both had to grow up a little, if that's possible. And if you ever found a soulmate, I think I've found mine. Yeah, that's smashing. <laughs> that's really yeah. smashing. In 1983, Pat published her autobiography, and announced that she was leaving Coronation Street for good. Though pressed by reporters, she refused to say why. I have told no one, and I don't intend to tell anyone about uh, anything. <laughs> there was no way she would have ever have allowed her character to finish up in the snug with a hairnet on. That was not for Pat, and it was not for Elsie. What have I done to deserve you, Dennis? I've got gorillas in me sink, chorus girls in me bed, and I go out for five minutes and you let the flaming bailiffs in. You ready, love? Hmm? Ready for off? Oh, yeah. Just dropped my keys in with a neighbour. How long are you away? Ah, now there's a question. I think artistically, it was a bit too late because the leading roles for middle-aged ladies are very few and far between. And Pat was not, at that point, offered them in the West End again. Instead, Pat featured in a new sitcom, worked as a presenter on TV AM, and performed on stage with Tony Booth. 
But in March 1986, Pat discovered she had cancer. It was a secret she kept from most people, including Tony. Her last ever play she was very proud of. Linda LaPlante offered it to her and said, she's the only person I want for this part. And um, Pat was pretty ill at that point. Well, what do you think, Harold? A few of us knew, but nobody on that show knew. I mean, you look 20 years younger. I've got a stage makeup on. In the summer of 1986, Pat and Tony were back on stage together in Scarborough. But after one week, Pat was rushed to hospital. And right until we were doing the play in Scarborough, I did not know that she had cancer. Because it was her decision to keep it from me. Pat Phoenix marries in hospital and she's given the last rites. Pat said to me that she wanted to die as Mrs Booth. She did look bad and as if she was very, very ill during the ceremony, but as soon as it was over, she seemed to just perk again, up again. again and it was the eyes and teeth. And she sat eyes up and, and she said, again. I've got married, it's your birthday, Pauline. Bring Let's in the cake. Let's have a party. Let's have a party. Yeah. <laughs> Champagne <did>. and everything. <gasps> yeah. Was it one last headline? Was it thumb in her nose? Who knows? Every paper had the uh, headlines front and front page and reacting the wedding and who was there and the certificate. The certificate made the middle pages, centre pages, and she was so happy. It was, it was one of, you know, she was so thrilled. I think she was married on her deathbed because she wanted to make sure Tony was all right, but also it was the end of the Princess in the Tower dream. The Six O'Clock News from the BBC. The actress Pat Phoenix ended her fight against cancer this morning. She died peacefully in her sleep at a hospital near Manchester. Her husband of just seven days, the actor Tony Booth, was at her bedside. I could not take it in that this fantastic spirit would die. If I like fellas, it's healthy. It doesn't mean to say that I, I, I want an easy meat for all of them. But I've got to know how you feel. Oh, I feel. I'll tell you how I feel. I feel as if I've been run over by a tram. I feel as if I'm having one of them nightmares that you can't wake up from. Now listen to me, Spaggy Bones. You watch your tongue. This is my house. What difference does that make? I'll show you what difference. Get out! In whatever she did, she was passionate. In work, in love, in life, she was passionate.